You guys feel safe at school? No. No. Right. So do you feel like like all of you like what is your safe is, is your house, your room, is that a safe place for you? Kind of not really for you, kind of. What about you guys? I feel like I don't have a safe place like physically, but maybe spiritually I do. Like okay. I don't think there's really like an individual space where a lot of people feel safe. Because at this point in this world that we live in, there's no safe really. Mm -hmm. Um there's security, but there's not that safety. So that's okay. something I put it off spiritual safe place. Yeah. So so she brought out a good point. There's a difference between security and safety. Yeah. Um so that like right now we're in this room and we've got security guard watching the building, you know, who's going in and out, you know, there's a lot of stuff. So from a security standpoint, we're we're pretty secure. You know, if anything weird's gonna happen out there or come this direction, it's probably gonna be dealt with long before it ever reaches us inside this room, right? So security wise we're probably okay. okay. Safety is not that is more of a feeling and an emotion, okay? Like, do I feel safe at the moment? I can, I, I know a lot of people um, who do not like crowds. They hate crowds. And crowds freak them out. Like, it's almost like a fear, a phobia, a fear of crowds. And so crowds freak them out, so they want to go and get alone. Why? Because they don't feel safe. They feel like there's like there's way too many people here. They get claustrophobic, don't know what people are doing, I can't watch everything, it just kind of freaks them out, right? So so safety becomes a completely different issue than security. Okay. Um, let's see, let's think about it in a different term. What other current event is happening right now that has that same security safety type of thing that's going on? Yes. I know in Korea because uh, North Korea, <coughs> because they're testing the nuclear, it's um, giving birth defects to children and making land unfarmable and destroying literally entire towns where it's unhospitable. They can't live there anymore, so they're just pushing them out. Yeah. Yeah. Nuclear testing, because they don't know what they're doing, uh, is killing things. One of the are wanting to kill other things. Um, yeah. So what, what else is happening? I mean, because it, it does center around North Korea. What else is happening in our world um, just this week? Kind of falls along that line. I mean, especially along with North Korea. Yes. I have no candy to throw at anybody. Oh, I think yeah, I'm really I, ill prepared I, here. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Is there? Mm -hmm. you have to throw out yes. Okay. Yeah. So you guys know that North Korea has been building up nuclear capability. Nuclear. When's the last time there was like a nuclear bomb dropped? Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Yeah, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, which is cities in Japan. Okay, Japan used to be an empire. Okay, you guys have probably seen the movie Pearl Harbor. You know, let's watch that movie where Japan attacked our, um, all of our naval uh, carrier fleet that was in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And so there's a big memorial there and different things. So they sunk a lot of our ships, killed a lot of our sailors. And that's what threw the United States into World War II. Before then, they were, didn't have any part of it. They were staying out of it. And so, yeah, we then built a massive army and a massive naval fleet after that. And we went over there and we then dropped the, the atomic bomb on them. Atomic bomb was a form of a nuclear warhead. Okay? It killed a lot of people. I mean, it's like massive destruction. And then you can't live there for a long time kind of thing. So that's what that's what um, North Korea is doing, right? They're trying to build up these nuclear weapons. We already have these weapons, types of weapons, okay? That doesn't mean that we are totally safe either or secure uh, just because we have them. But the problem is, is we have somebody who wants to shoot them at us, and that's what North Korea wants to do. So, so current event is our president is right now. He's been in South Korea. 
He's been in Japan, and he's today has been in China, talking with those world leaders about how to deal with the issue of North Korea. Because what is the deal? North Korea's advances are now threatening my safety. Okay, do I feel safe? And so what they're doing is the opposite, is they're working now to try to figure out security and how to secure North Korea from not doing what they're threatening to do. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's kind of like the current events. Both things are kind of the same, where there's a security side, but then there's this feeling of safety, okay? So I want you guys to, to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians, the book of Philippians. Philippians is in the New Testament, so that means it's to the right. So take most of it, throw it to the left, okay? And those of you that are using a black Bible, we're going to Philippians chapter 4. So when you find a page number, shout it out. What is it? 982. 982, page 982, if you're using one of the black Bibles. Okay, everybody else? Philippians chapter 4. Okay. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about. Oh, isn't that nice? Okay. Are y'all hot in here? It's getting hot in here. Give it to me. Okay. All right. Somebody keep me good on time here. We get out of here at 7 30. Is that right? Okay. All right. So so here's this here's this book, okay? So this book, Philippians, okay, is written to a group of people that have become believers in Jesus, and they live in an ancient city called Philippi. So in other words, that's the first part of the word, that's, for, that's the town's name, and so they're called the Philippians, just like you live in Tulsa. A lot of people call us Tulsanians, okay, because you live in Tulsa. So this is the Philippians, because they live in Philippi, okay? Now, this particular group of people have that, that whole, group kind of came together because of its writer, and its writer's name is Paul. And we kind of affectionately call him the Apostle Paul, and he wrote a lot of letters in the New Testament. Okay, There's a lot of books that he wrote in the New Testament. So this particular group, Paul was very influential and helped starting this group and introduced these people to Jesus, and they became, they became followers of Jesus. Okay, Well, Paul couldn't stay there very long, because Paul got in trouble. Paul had a buddy of his, his name was Silas. And so Paul and Silas got in trouble, and basically the cops got them, threw them in jail. Okay, So they were in jail, and kind of not really, they really didn't do anything wrong, it's just what they were talking about was what people didn't like. They didn't like talking about Jesus, they didn't talk about, they didn't like what that meant as far as change in life and that type of thing, so they threw them in jail. So while Paul and Silas are in jail, then you know they've been beaten, um, and they, they literally were, they took these rods and they just beat them, so they've been bloodied up all over their body, beaten by rods, and now they're in jail, and they've got chains. So this is like the old style things, you know, if you think about medieval, they've got these big old um, clasps that goes over your, uh, over your wrist, and they've got chains hidden, and you're probably chained to a wall, and you're chained to somebody else, so you ain't going nowhere, nowhere fast, okay? It's that kind of thing. And so, and there's a jailer there, a guy that is like, he's like the jailer, he's the, he's the guy in the jail, making sure everybody's okay, and, and, and safe. So Paul and Silas, they start singing, okay? And they start praising Jesus, and in the middle of that, this massive earthquake hits, Okay, and by the time the earthquake hits and it finishes, all their chains and their the cuts and everything has fallen off of them, and all the doors of the prison have been thrown open. Okay, so the jailer goes, if everybody escapes, then what's going to happen? Well, all of his his superiors they're going to kill him because he let them, that he let them all escape. And so he takes out his sword, he's about to kill himself. And Paul goes, don't, don't kill yourself. We are all still here. And so because Paul did that, he did not kill himself. And so Paul then talks to him about Jesus. And in the middle of that, that jailer 
really he has an experience with Jesus, and so uh, so he kind of he he becomes a, a Christ follower. He follows Jesus. So now there's these other people that Paul have have talked with this jailer and his whole family came and they all became followers of Jesus, which then kind of established a church, a group of Jesus followers in the town of Philippians. Well, Paul and Silas had to hit the road. They went on down the road somewhere else, so they left Luke, who was a physician who kind of traveled with Paul, there in that town, and so Paul kind of taught these, uh, I'm sorry, Luke kind of taught these people, and so of how to to be, how to be, how to grow in their faith and grow in their relationship with Jesus. So that's what happened. That Philippian church began to grow. Well, here's the problem is that that Philippian church started coming under persecution. And persecution in these days is very, very similar to what happened on Sunday morning. Okay? That would mean that they would grab you, they would take you, they knew that you were a Christian, so they'd take you, they would go beat you, they would do something to you, they may kill you, they may kill members of your family to try to torture you or, or something. So that was happening a lot with this church. And so they were under a lot of struggles. But the one thing they loved is they loved Paul. And so they kept supporting Paul, and they would send him money wherever he was. When he was over here, they knew he was over somewhere, so they would they, like, they would all take up a big contribution, a bunch of money, and they would send stuff to Paul so that it would help Paul. And so what they have done is they have done that same thing. They found out that Paul was now in Rome. Y'all know you know, Rome, Italy? Y'all know where Rome, Italy's at? Okay, same town. It hadn't changed in all these years. Over 2,000 years, it's still the same town. Okay, he is in Rome, and Paul is kind of in prison again, but this time, he's under house arrest. So it's like he's got the big ankle bracelet, they know where he's going, they monitor him all the time, kind of deal. So he is there, okay, and but Paul knows the end of his life is coming pretty quickly. So he's kind of he's got this emotional war in himself where he doesn't know if he's safe any day. He doesn't know if this is the last day he's going to live. So Paul is struggling with the whole safety and security of his life all the time. And he sends the Philippians send this gift to him, and it's this big gift. I mean, like we're talking a lot of money to where it's going to sustain Paul the rest of his life until he finally is killed later on for his faith in Jesus. And so, anyway, so this whole letter, this thing back to him, that, 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 I'm sorry, this letter that he writes is basically a big thank you letter, okay? Thanking this, these people for sending this gift, okay? But here's what's happening in this church, okay, with these people. They're under persecution. I mean, they're getting, they're getting beat up all the time. But guess what else is happening? They're fighting amongst themselves. Okay? They're not in unity. They bicker, and they blame, and they're complaining, and they're fighting amongst themselves all the time. So there's a lot of strife that's happening amongst these people. Okay, And so they're not together. And because they're not together, it's making their condition even worse. Okay, So Philippians 4, I want you to go to verse 4. Okay, and somebody read me verse 4 and 5, real quick. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all people, the Lord is near. Okay, that's verse 4 and 5. Good, read yes. verse 6. Abby, read verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and... I cannot read that. Sorry, I should start saying but thanksgiving, let your request be made known to us. Okay. All right. Scott, verse 7. <clears throat> Peace of God, which strengthens all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ. Okay. And then there's this last really long verse, verse 8. And it says this. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Okay. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Okay, so he's told them a lot, okay, right? So we did. We just read five verses, 
And he said a lot of stuff just in those five verses. He starts out with rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. And the rejoice here is not like, woohoo, this is awesome, we party. You know, everything's exciting, it's all happening. You've got to be on like that all the way. That is not what he's talking about, okay? That you got to you got to be up at the top all the time. It's talking about joy in your heart, okay? So I wanted to say, is there a difference between being between having joy and being happy? Is there a difference between those two? Mm-hmm. Okay, tell me what's the difference of that between having joy and being happy. Happy is temporary. Okay, why is happy temporary? Something like this, and then you're like, this is great, and all of a sudden something happens, like, oh crap. Okay. So, so happy is like this. Okay, so if happy is like this, what makes that different than joy? If you're truly joyful about something, you're truly willing to, then nothing will really set off that mood. It's like constant. Okay. So, so happy does this. But joy is kind of doing this the whole time, right? It's stable. It's not moving around. Okay, what what would make you? What gives you joy? What gives you joy, Joshua? Basketball. Basketball, because you can always go out and play. Whether it's outside, inside, raining, snowing, makes no difference. You know about snowing? I played basketball in snow once. It was pretty cool. It was snowing. It wasn't like tons of snow. It was snowing. So it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so just the love of something, right? You love basketball. You, love, you enjoy playing. It's awesome. Okay? So joy is on a different level. It says right here. Okay? Because my mood, my emotions is where happy goes. I can be happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. You know these people. Right? You go to school with them all the time. You, know, you don't know which one of them you're going to meet today or in the morning. They were happy when you left. When you come back, they're sad. You never know where they're at. Okay? They're just highly volatile people. But he says, be joy, be full of joy in the Lord, or rejoice, be full of joy. And he said, again, I say rejoice. Sometimes when I'm unhappy, I have to make a choice to become happy. Okay? Because just because I'm feeling low, that can that can that really affects my attitude, my outlook, my what I'm doing with something. But here, Paul is telling these people, okay, they've got a lot of sadness. They've got a lot of hard things going on. There's a lot of strife. There's a lot of this happening all the time. Okay? And he's saying, you've got to be full of joy because joy is here. Okay? If you're going to be happy, you're going to be happy, sad, happy, sad. But joy is right here. So he said, so... Be rejoice always, or stay in joy always. And again, I say rejoice, which also puts this connotation: is you've got to choose your attitude. Okay, you're going to choose your attitude. Why is that important? Well, let's look at the next verse. Okay, um, he says this: Let everyone see that you are that you are um, considerate in all you do. This I'm reading from a different translation. Remember, the Lord is coming. So basically, he's saying this: Listen. If you're like this all the time, it's because everybody's watching you. If you can stay joyful here, and you stay on constant playing, he said, remember, everybody's here is watching you. And if you're a Christ follower, one of the things that we should be, we should not be riding the roller coaster all the time. It doesn't mean that we don't experience the emotion. It's just we shouldn't be here, and here, and here, and all that. What does that make us? It makes us look like schizophrenics. Okay? You don't know what it is. You're emotional. You know, Jesus, Jesus in your life, the Word of God in your life, will keep you right here on an even plane. No matter what happens in your life, you fail a test, your girlfriend dumps you, you know, you don't make the team, whatever happens, you know, you can still stay here. You will feel the emotions, but your joy is something different. It's something that stabilizes you in the middle of it. And so he says this, people are watching. Let everyone else see. And then he verse in verse 6. Okay, look at verse 6 again. Okay, I'm going to switch because I know you guys are doing. Okay, verse 6 says, Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. Okay, don't be anxious. What in the world is anxious? What is anxious? 
Anxiety? What, who else was saying? Having fear of the future. Fear of fear of the future? Okay, yes. That's cool. Anybody else got something? Being ready, excited, or something like that. Okay, it's kind of a different type of anxious. Yeah. A, a test. You're nervous. Kind of a queasy feeling. Butterflies in your stomach. Kind of type of thing. Yes. Yeah. Uncertainty. That's a good way. Okay. So, if uncertainty is an issue, okay, I want to I want to tie this back here for a second to safety. Is safety something that you feel gives if I don't feel safe, it's because I'm uncertain about it, right? Yeah. I'm very uncertain. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going on. Okay? Here Paul gives a remedy to this. These people walked out of their door every day, did not know what could happen to them today. Okay? Uh, maybe some of you have been in a situation where you don't know if today is my last day or not. You know, we don't think that way. I mean, I don't think that way. I think like, I got this today, I got something else going tomorrow, I've got a few things happening, I'm planning some trips in the summer, you know, I'm going to be doing this in a couple of years, you know, I'm always thinking, I got tomorrow, I got tomorrow, I got tomorrow, right? And yet, where they're at, they're looking at every day I walk out of my house, this could be my last day. Now, wouldn't that give you a little anxiety? Okay, I would be pretty anxious. I would be very uncertain. I would not feel safe at all about what's going to happen the next day, okay? Or what's going to happen today. So Paul steps in the middle. He knows this. He knows that they've been, that that's the way they feel, that that's what they, they're having in their life. You know why? He is having the same feeling. Everything for him is exactly the same. He doesn't know. If you read in the first chapter of this, of this book, he even says that. I feel like today could be my last day. This could be it. I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm in this place of, do I, is it ready to go on to die, to be with, to, to go on to heaven, to be with Jesus, or should I be staying here because it's better for the Philippians and others? I, I'm, in a, I'm an emotional wreck to a degree because of all this. So Paul gives them this little clue of saying, hey guys, I have learned something. I've got something here that I want to tell you because I'm in the same position that you are in. Okay? So let's read this again. Okay? He says in verse 6, don't be anxious about anything. We're like, thank you, Paul. We appreciate that. Okay? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm full of it. I'm, yeah. you know, we have, that's what they call anti, uh, what do they call those? An, uh, not anxiety, but yeah. Anti-anxiety, is that what they're called? Pills? Antidepressants. Antidepressants. They have all kinds of pills for these things. People that are so amped up with anxiety and then depression. I mean, it's just, here, this is them. This is them. I mean, if we went around the room, we could name them. Okay? They're so up and down. They're so all over the place. But he says this, don't be anxious about anything. And he says, so, okay, thank you, Paul. So how do I do that? So he outlines, here's the, here's the, here's the way to do that. He said this, that in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Okay, by prayer, thank you, Paul. Everything by prayer. What does that mean? Just by prayer. Pray about everything. Okay, pray about everything. So, and prayer is simply what? Talking to God. Talking to God. Just talking to God about it. Okay, so so uh, can, can you guys, do you mind if for like the next five minutes, we just kind of take the onion peels off of this little thing right here. Okay, you ready? You ready to dive in? Okay, because we're going to look at this word prayer. We're going to look at this word supplication, thanksgiving, request, and known. Those five words right there. You see those five words in that, in that sentence? Okay, you got those five words? Okay, prayer. Prayer is just this. It is simply talking to God. It does not need to be in a church. It does not need to be in a kneeling position. It is not, I don't even have to bow my head. I don't have to do anything. When it comes to talking to God, I can talk to God. And here's the thing. God hears me even when I'm not talking. Okay? God can hear my thoughts. So, you're sitting, you're about to take a test. What is the first thing you go Okay. Did that? Did you say that? No. You thought that. Okay. 
So even in my own thoughts, even without me saying something, I can begin, because God is a whole lot different, okay? He is not, he is not like the enemy, Satan, who can only pick up on what you say. He can pick up on your body language. He can pick up, but he does not know what you are thinking. He cannot hear your thoughts. God, on the other hand, knows everything about you. He knows your thoughts. He knows what you've been thinking about. Okay? He knows what you're going to think about. He knows the things that you've been planning in your head as you've been thinking about it. Okay? So, right here is a big clue, and because God already knows these things, then He can also communicate with you even there. Okay? He can communicate with you even in the thought realm. How many of you have ever heard God talk? Does God not talk? Have you ain't heard Him? Well, wait a minute. So, who's doing all the talking? And am I the only one doing the talking? No. See, God is, he's different. So because he can also hear your thoughts, I can also talk to him even in my thoughts, even if words are not coming out of my mouth. What does this mean? It gives you full access with God. He did not hold anything back from you. He's saying, listen, everything about me is wide open. I am right here. You can come to me. And so by prayer, he's saying, any, any form of communication you have with God, that is called prayer. Worship can be a part of prayer. Talking can be a part of prayer. Thinking, or saying, God, what do you think about I mean, I'm doing this all day. Lord, what do you think about this? Well, I'm thinking about this, and I'm kind of weighing it back and forth. What about this? You know, and trying to plan. That's the way my thoughts are all the time. That's how I am communicating with God. What do you think about this? You know, and I think through it, and I'm going, what do you think, Lord? So what is this? What else do I not see? In? What, what else do I need to know that I don't know? You know, that's constant communication. Because if I sit and worry and fret and fear, what does that bring me back to? Anxiety, which makes me do this. I'm back on this roller coaster again. Okay. So he said this, everything by prayer, and then this word supplication. Supplication is this form of, of, of adding requests, or, or really it's more this, it's a begging. Okay. It's almost a begging, a pleading. It's a, I mean, I, it's, a, it's old English words, okay? This is what they use in like the 1600s kind of thing, okay? Supplicating. But it is to beg, it's to plead. It's like, um, uh, when you want something, okay? And you go to your parents, you go to the person that you think can give that to you, and you start dropping subtle hints, okay? And before you know it, you're almost begging, you're pleading, man, I, I really want that, I need that. And you kind of go through that whole thing, and go, I need this, this is no longer want, this is a need, I need this thing, okay? Even though you don't need nothing, but you think you need it, okay? And so you're begging, you're in a mode of begging, and that's what he's saying here. You can do this by prayer, but God don't mind your begging. That doesn't sound like does it? God don't mind your begging. He's fine. He can handle it. Okay? He's fine with you coming to him over and over and over and pleading your case and begging and saying, okay, I need this. Okay? Then what he said, with thanksgiving. Right? Next word, thanksgiving. This is just a gratefulness. Just a gratefulness that God is doing a lot for you. And you're recognizing that he's doing that for you. The next word is, let your request. Okay, so you've got an attitude of prayer, which means I've got a direct communication, I have access, I have entry into God to have a conversation with Him, and He doesn't mind my begging, He doesn't mind me pleading my case, He doesn't mind me yelling about so-and-so, and what they did to me, and how bad the issue is, and what's going on, He can take it, okay? All right, some of you, I know this is not the case for anybody in here, but some of you dropped in some four-letter words, okay? Because you're mad, or you're thinking bad, or whatever else, okay? Um, God's not going to put condemning you because you're thinking it, okay? And even you expressing it to God is getting your heart out to Him, okay? Because if you're not holding anything back either, 
I'm telling you, this book you got sitting right here, there's murderers, there's prostitutes, there's adultery, there's lying, there's cussing like you've never seen cussing before in your life. There's all kinds of stuff that's in this Bible. And all of it is about people who live real lives just like you're living. You live a real life, they live a real life. God can handle your real. Okay? He can handle your real. So be real. Because we think if I'm going to approach to God that i got to do it the Christian way, or i got to do it the church way, or i got to do it the, the, the good way. Okay? God's more interested in your real than he is in your good or your church or your Christian, whatever other thing you want to mask it to be. Be real with God. That is what he is saying here. I'm wide open. You get direct access to God. You can beg, you can plead, you can do whatever, but come with an attitude of gratefulness because God is the one who can answer your prayer. Okay? You don't want to make him mad. Okay? He's the guy that can answer it for you. I'm kind of being silly here. Okay? But to make your request, which is just that, God, I need this to happen. God, I need this to change. It is truly a request, a making a request of, I need this. And then, what is this, to be made known? There's our last word, known. Okay? Make your request be made known to God. This goes back to the real part. I'm going to be making it known. It's not like I'm going to quietly sit around. Okay? I'm looking for some new Jordans. Okay? I want the new kind, you know, the really good looking kind. You know, that's they're probably what, 200, 250? Yeah, something like that. Okay, so I'm looking for some Jordans, okay? If I'm going to start dropping some hints about I need some Jordans, I, I might start so, okay? But before long, everybody's going to know I'm going to be wanting some Jordans, okay? Because what's going to be happening? I'm going to be talking about, hey, y'all you know, see the new Jordans coming up? These Jordans are, ooh, sweet. You see that? Boy, I'm liking this color. I'm liking that color. You know, be, what's happening? I'm making it known that I'm going to get these. I want some Jordans. Okay? You see, we do this in life all the time. But why don't we do that with God? Why do we, why don't we hold back? Okay? He's given us wide access. Okay? So we looked at those five words, right? We looked at prayer, supplication. We looked at thanksgiving. We made requests. And we made it known. In other words... I'm making it known, God, this is exactly what I want. What did he say next? Okay, we're going to wrap this up. He says, if I do this, if I'm real with God, if I am making this request, if I can, if I will supplicate, I, even if I'm begging, okay, what happens? It says this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will what? Guard your heart and your mind. This is security and safety all wrapped in together at once. Okay? The safety feeling is what I have. If, I am, if I'm at peace, I feel safe. Okay? If I am guarded because of security, then what happens? My, my, he is going to guard my heart and my mind. Why? Why is it important that I would guard my mind, as we 